What's up, everybody? I'm actually starting to feel bad for my viewers that happen to be of this faith after the last few videos and this one. And I just want to reiterate, I am not saying anything bad about you or anyone in your congregation. I think 99% of the people here are swell folks. But the upper management 1% of this organization is shady as far back as I can see. But if you don't understand this organization's role in history, the Church of Rome, then you're not seeing the bigger picture. They've influenced the history of the last 700 years more than anybody else. When the world began switching to Christianity, these were the priests of the old temples. And the priestly class has been right up there with kings and emperors for luxury and extravagance. So they're not going to let some poor, dirty Christians take over their business. They just converted their temples to churches. And it would seem a lot of pagan traditions came along with that. But in spite of all that, there are a lot of people in here that just believe in the message of Jesus and love thy neighbor. That's great. It wasn't always like that, though. <laughs> like when they launched a, quote, holy crusade against the Cathars. This really does sum it up. A bunch of well-armed, well-trained, equipped, mounted cavalry against some religious guys that all of the locals referred to as the good men. Things did not work out well for anyone who thought that of them, though. Now, this was going on in the 13th century, and then let's fast forward to the 16th and 17th centuries, and this is what the real Protestant Reformation was. They give it a nice little name, but it was really more modern crusades. There's never been a time in history that you wanted to go up against the Church of Rome, and this stands till this very day. They're elbow deep in all of it. So what did the good men do to deserve extinction? Well, they just believed different than what the clergy was teaching. And you can't have that. You know how people today are trying to control every little thing that you think and are able to say? It's exactly that. So the Cathars and what's known as the Albigensian Crusade were in southern France, northern Italy. This map is kind of showing the spread of Gnosticism and uh, dualistic beliefs. And I'm going to start off with the theological side of everything, and if you want to just get to the nitty-gritty and just watch the battle scene, you can go to the time on the screen. Everybody knows the basic gist of Christianity, so I'll spare you. Though there's enough differences between Protestants and Roman and Eastern Orthodoxy that it can hardly all be called the same thing. They all have Jesus in common, but what you're supposed to do about it differs greatly. At the Council of Nicaea, they allegedly got together and hashed all of this out and wrote the law. But they were nowhere close to all in agreement before that. The different factions were fighting so much that Constantine called everybody together to say, you got to come to an agreement here. At least that's how the story goes. I'm leery of anything with Constantine or Church of Rome because they forged documents saying that Constantine gave the powers of the emperor to the Pope. But this is how much different some of the old sects of Christianity were, like Marcionism, which is really close to, if not the basis for Gnosticism. Marcion preached that the benevolent God of the gospel who sent Jesus Christ into the world as Savior was the true supreme being, different and opposed to the malevolent demiurge or creator God identified with the Hebrew God of the Old Testament. Now, Christians believe that the God of the Old Testament is the one true God creator of everything and that Jesus was his only begotten son. But Marcion called the Old Testament God the stranger God or alien God, as this deity had not had any previous interactions with the world and was wholly unknown. Marcion also taught that Christ was a spiritual entity that was sent to reveal the truth about existence, thus allowing humanity to escape the earthly trap of the Demiurge. Let's define the Demiurge, because this carries into Gnostic belief. It's basically that there is a supreme, all-loving, good God, but that isn't who created this world. They say this was done by a lesser being that had many flaws, which is why we have such a flawed world. This is somewhat akin to Hindu beliefs, where Brahma created the world, and he was so impressed with it, he started growing extra heads so he could see all of it at once. So he's admiring his creation from every direction, and Shiva comes along and chops one of them heads off. Brahma says, yo, what the F, bro? And Shiva says, how can you be proud of this creation? Look around, there's pain and suffering and 
loneliness, jealousy, uh, anger. How could you possibly be proud of yourself for creating this mess? I might be paraphrasing a little bit there. But Hindus, Marcian, Gnostics all share the belief that this world is fundamentally flawed. While Marcian taught that the God of the Old Testament wasn't the supreme being, nor the father of Jesus. So, of course, this was heretical to the mainstream, because mainstream's always right. And I'm sure this is sacrilege to a lot of people. I want to say this. I grew up going to church, and some of my earliest memories were a rural church in northern Mississippi that looked about like this, and we were the only white family in an all-black church. And I'm not even kidding. I I was one of the five white kids that rode the bus to school. And we sat at the back of the bus. It was like a reverse Jim Crow. Anyway, by my teenage years, we're going to a Southern Baptist church in the Ozarks, and we start learning about Old Testament And I still remember getting scarred from when they dropped the concept of eternity on me. I was up all night going, wait, so my parents made me and all of a sudden I am. And now I'm here for eternity, forever. And I'm already definitely noticing things ain't that great here. But I better get it right or I'm going to spend eternity in flames hotter than when you burn your finger on the stove. And I never even asked to be born. This stuff's traumatizing to a kid. Okay, so then we got to learning about the Old Testament. Up till now, it's been Jesus loves you, God is good, he got the whole world in his hands. And then we start learning the stories out of the Old Testament, where when some kids were teasing a prophet for being bald, then two bears came out of the woods and mauled everybody. (laughs) And then there's multiple battles to where the Lord calls for a G-side all the way down to the livestock. Then they tell you how the Lord is a vengeful, wrathful, jealous God. When they were wandering the desert and they murmured against God, started complaining, he sent snakes to bite them. Then eventually in his mercy, Moses put a snake on a stick and if they looked on it in the name of God, then they'd be healed. So there's some crazy stuff in the Old Testament and I'm going, wait, whatever happened to he got the whole world in his hands? Jesus still loves me, right? And I know I'm not the only one to have this problem when I was a kid. Now I'm a little older, I can appreciate a righteous vengeance. But there's a lot to be reconciled between the teachings of Jesus and the God of the Old Testament. But I don't know one Christian that says, well, I follow God because he's powerful and can destroy my enemies. No, Christians are Christians because Jesus said, love thy neighbor as thyself and let's make this world a better place. So the question of whether the God of the Old Testament is who Jesus was calling Father was something that I thought about long before I heard of Marcionism or Gnosticism. And I'm not going to go into it right now, but there's a lot of things Jesus said that makes me wonder. But he was constantly fighting with the Pharisees, who are the keepers of the law of the Old Testament. But Marcion, in the early days of Christianity, prior to the Council of Nicaea and the Rome Church of Rome unifying this as a religion— thought that Jesus was sent from the supreme God to help us to escape this soul trap, and that a lesser God, or demiurge, had created this realm with a bunch of flaws. The Gnostics take it a step further to say that the creator God is an actually evil God, and same thing, that he keeps souls trapped in physical bodies and imprisoned in the material universe. They call him Yaldaboath, also known as the Son of Chaos, the God-eater, And names like that make me think of aerial phenomena of the past, by the way. But he's also known as the Great Architect, which probably sounds familiar to some of you. But this Great Architect is the Shadow God and the primal source and origin of all evil. But you guys didn't know the Matrix was thousands of years old. But yeah, the soul trap, this illusion of reality, all came from Gnosticism. But now think about the Stoneworkers Guild. They're all about the great architect, the god of this world. So does this mean that they know that there's a supreme god whose life spark is in each one of us while we're trapped in this material realm, and Jesus came to save us and try to help us escape, who is of the true god, and they decided, no, we like this world. We like being rich. We like all the kinky parties. Which I'm actually starting to wonder if that's actually true about the Masons, and it's just the J-suits accusing them of exactly what they're doing. It's a huge 
tactic of theirs. And if you've seen my video on the middle-aged churches, you know they were freaks. Anyway, just some thoughts. Yaldabaoth falsely perceives itself as the sole deity in the entire cosmos. With this mindset, it brought the physical realm into existence, exp- establishing its own heaven populated by counterfeit angels and commanding a retinue of personal servants known as the Archons. You probably heard about the Archons. They're these evil entities that operating this reality and they feed off of negativity. We're just producing this negative energy that they live on. Okay, so here's the breakdown. The Gnostics, Marcians, Church of Rome, and all kinds of different sects of Christianity that Jesus came from the true God. But quite a few of them had decided that's not who they're talking about in the Old Testament. Maybe sometime I'll do a video debating the merits of that, but Rome was allied with the Pharisees because that's who controlled religion in Jerusalem. And what they think, like Ben Shapiro said, is Jesus was just a rebel that tried to start an uprising, and they wanted him gone from the minute he walked into town. So Rome's whole approach to Christianity was just like Pontius Pilate. He didn't think Jesus deserved capital punishment. But he's just being a bureaucrat, and who's he going to try to make happy? These wandering fishermen that got a town all stirred up? Or the rich Pharisees who run all of the administrative sides of the town, the temples, and education? It would appear that Rome has used the Pharisees to manage their financial affairs ever since. Several prominent family dynasties have come and gone, but the Church of Rome has stayed. And they agreed that this is the official narrative of Christianity. And by the official dates of 10th to 12th century, which I think was not long after all this happened, but if you didn't agree with this official narrative of history, then you were a heretic, and they had their ways of dealing with heretics. Now, the Cathars, who all the locals called the good men, had these castles all over southern France, and they lived these austere lives, forsaking comfort and luxury, which is the exact opposite of the opulence of Rome. And it would appear that our whole idea of the medieval monk all the way down to the haircut was hijacked from the Cathars and repatriated to the clergy, which is just demented when you hear how this went down. The main Cathars were these monks that would go around in pairs and evangelize to people. They were well-liked by the public, and when the Popa forbade their existence... The local king and some counts and all the people of the town all supported the Cathars, but they weren't the Cathars. There were just, you know, a few thousand of them, but hundreds of thousands of people living in southern France. So Pope Innocent III, and you're being taught history by the bad guys, so they'll tell you how he was one of the most powerful and influential of the medieval popas. But this is a much more accurate description of this guy. So Innocent started this whole ordeal, and that's where we get the name ordeals from the Inquisition. And this went on for a hundred years, trying to ferret out all of these monks. Then came Boniface VIII. He came from northern Italy, and he allied with Saint Dominic of Spain and Simone de Montefort of France, who would later lead a revolt against the King of England in one of clergy's many attempts to take over England. So all of these powerful men and their armies decide to exterminate the monks of southern France, i.e. heavy cavalry against a bunch of monks that lived off-grid. They didn't just go after these Cathar monks. If towns and fiefdoms didn't rat them out, then they were made examples of. And Berrier, however you say that, 60,000 people, with the attitude of dispatch them all and God will know who are his. At the fortress of Minerva, it was promised that those who repented would be allowed to live. Nevertheless, they were burned. The Knights of the Holy Spirit, these godly men, performed their duties to the gown with an extreme joy all across southern France. Inhabitants fled into the woods and mountains until only Carcassonne remained, but no one dared defend it. The entire south of France was leveled. Not a single stone remained standing. All of the fortresses were demolished. All counts and barons were fitted with neckties or kindling. And all the noble ladies were stoned out of gallantry. Wasn't that nice of them? So that's the story of the Albigensian Holy Crusade. And I need to do a video just on the Crusades. 
We're just talking papal mercenaries. Now, here's the twist to all this. This is right at the same time as the 14th century cataclysms I've told you about, where I've got records of civilizations on every continent getting wiped out at this time. And officially, you have the Black D. So did papal armies leave no stone unturned in southern France, or did Mother Nature in a bunch of quakes? Maybe the truth of all of this is a little more like they were hunting and eliminating the Cathars. Then disaster struck, supply lines were broken, and a whole region succumbed to famine. Now, this seems like an absolutely brutal cover story, if that's what happened. But if you're trying to convince everybody that you are the regents of God on earth, and the only way to God is through the Popa, and it's alternating between drought and flooding and the earth shaking and lights falling out of the sky, there's massive mortification everywhere you look, and it would appear God has cursed life on earth, then it doesn't reflect very well on you if you're claiming you're best buddies with God. So I would say that there were some legendary battles, the way they would put it, but I am thinking that there's more to this story. If you actually made it this far, you're a champ. How about dropping me a like, and I'll catch you on the next one. Static out.